The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, we're going to go over what it takes to start a garden, as well as different types of gardening methods. Our guest will be founder of Seed Linked, Dylan Bruce. And your garden questions. The hour is full and it starts right now. You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden focused radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Welcome to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. I'm your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Holly Baird. This is a program for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, make your trees look greener and your grasses healthier, grow your garden more successful, and canning what you grow. We appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us, whether you're listening to us on one of the 15 stations across the country that are broadcasting our program this year in 2020, podcast replay, in-studio video replay, or a radio app. Thank you for being part of the program. Uh, If you uh, want to get a hold of us, you can do that. Our communication lines are always available for you at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-SHOW. Or you can send us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. And whether you call now, during the show, after the show, middle of the next week, you can leave a message if we can't get to you, and we will call you back with the answer to your problem. Well, we've got a big show lined up for you, so let's get into the program and go over and talk about and discuss what does it take to start a garden. And and many people, Holly, might think, go oh, just some dirt and a shovel. But there's more to this than just a dirt and uh, some dirt and a shovel. That's correct. But you also don't necessarily even need ground. Right. Or a backyard or a front yard or a side yard or... Or any kind of yard. Any kind of yard, exactly. Um, But you don't even need that. So you can do indoor growing. And this is something that can be done year-round, whether it be a uh, window garden, a three- or four-season porch... Or use um, a, a grow light like a Happy Leaf LED. Now, the only disclaimer that would be need would be needed to be uh, inserted here is, if you're going to grow year-round indoors, you would need to figure out the type of pl- the, the the light duration for the plant or plants in which you're trying to grow. Some of them are day neutral, which means it doesn't matter how much light they get. I mean, six hours or eight hours, they're going to do fine, kind of like a tomato. However, onions are daylight sensitive, meaning they require a certain amount of daylight at certain parts of their growing cycle in order to bulb correctly. And that's why we have short day, long day, and neutral day onion varieties. And they are grown different parts of the United States uh, based on the daylight during the summer months. So that's the only uh, disclaimer would be growing indoors. And there are people that do this very successfully, grow herbs uh, one of the most costly things you can get at the grocery store uh, in very large quantities indoors without any issue whatsoever. <clears throat> so let's talk about, uh, so people don't have to have a yard. No. But if you have a yard, it can be, to some degree, a little easier. Maybe, maybe not. Depends on uh, what your uh, goals are into uh, gardening. Right. So one thing I think would be best to say is that um, except that you are going to have failures. Going to kill at least a thousand plants. Exactly. Um, you might want to try, experiment, be creative, what have you. But either way, if this is your first year gardening, you want to start small. You might have a neighbor who has a huge garden and you're like, I want to be just like him. No, you, no, you no, don't. You, don't. <laughs> you will you will feel so frustrated. So you want to start small, whether it be like to raise beds or just like a small plot whatever, but you want to start small. They always say the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. However, they never disclose to you how much higher their water belly is because they kept watering that grass over and over again to keep it green. Right. A lot of work. Or maybe they just are, they have more experience keeping their grass green. Right. But, you know, two four by four foot raised beds or even two four by four foot plots in the, in the backyard, 
that's 32 square feet. Now, there's a, I mean, if for some people, you may think, oh, 32 square feet isn't very much. You can still produce quite a bit in 32 square feet. Now, obviously, mathematics is, you know, it's in the numbers. If you have 3,200 square feet, you're going to grow substantially more, but there's a substantial more work and weeding and maintenance and soil prep and plant taking care of and all that. Start small, understand what you're growing, and then expand outward to a larger and more um, diverse garden in the years to come. Right, and that's one thing is that you definitely need to start small and realize that um, it is something that you are going to learn along the way. And then you want to decide what you'd like to grow. I want to grow okra. I don't like okra. I want to grow okra. Why do you want to grow okra? I don't know. We've, but, had, people, <laughs> we've had people at talks back when we used to be able to give garden talks. They would say, I want to learn how, how do I grow this? Well, do you like eating this? Not really. Well, why do you want to grow this? I don't know. <laughs> and I think that's another thing is that people get excited. Maybe they go to the garden center. They see those seedlings. They see it on TV. They see TV, it on TV. YouTube. Yeah, YouTube. They see, you know, whoever. Maybe it was somebody in their family that grew phenomenal XYZ, but they hated that thing like okra, but they feel compelled to grow it. So grow what you know you're going to enjoy and eat. Also grow what you uh, do your research and find out here and make a list. Here's the things I like to eat. Then figure out if those things can be grown in your geographical area. Yeah, I like bananas, but can't grow bananas in Zone 4 in Minneapolis. That type of thing. So you want to be very aware of what you can and can't grow. Now, that doesn't say that you can't what is called push the boundaries and grow a tropical or subtropical plant. I mean, technically yeah. growing tomatoes in... in Any place. Besides, any place yeah. besides maybe like Texas or Florida or whatever... Is pushing the boundaries. Peppers are a tropical plant too, so right. you know, so, keep that in mind. So, but it's so common. So, like, just like we grow yacans, right? And we'll get into that. Uh, choose your lo location. Are you planting in a raised bed in the ground, in the side yard, in the in the front yard? Where is this garden going to be? Are you going to do it in the ground? Are you going to construct raised beds? Are you going to get grow bags from RootMaker.com? And use coupon code RADIO21 to save you 15% on your entire purchase. What, 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 is your, what is the end game? What is the end goal? And then work your way back. I want to grow 25 beautiful tomatoes. Okay, so that's the, that's the goal. Then you step yourself back and go, how do I achieve this? How, what do I need to do? Back, 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 all the way to putting the plants in the ground. And it's okay if what, you're, if what your plan is is to get starts from the garden center, there's no shame nope. in that. Not everybody we, is. We like still us. do it, right? And now everybody is like us and has the resources, time, patience, whatever space to start seeds. Or maybe you have a dog that eats every plant in your house, or a cat that eats every plant in your house, or a small child that eats every plant in your house, and it might just be better for you to save yourself the headache and go to the garden center and get your starts. Right, and 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 then now with all that said, we want to invest in basic tools but good quality tools yeah you can go to the dollar store and get a trowel uh, sh or a little tiny shovel for a dollar how and or you could go to the garden center and buy a similar trowel or gar or, or garden shovel uh for 15 dollars. now one tip i want to provide there is that when you're looking at the garden tools if the metal goes into the handle and kind of goes through the handle forged in like one forged, yeah, yeah, one, in one one piece one piece forged metal with a, a rubber or whatever handle around it that's going to save you uh, money overall it's an investment perhaps up front but overall it's, it's less likely to break because if you go to the dollar store and buy that dollar tool you know why it's a dollar because it's el cheapo you bought on sale and if you do any aggressive digging whatsoever you may be buying another dollar tool in a couple of weeks or several over the course of the year. And before you know it, you've already spent that $15. You would have just been better off buying that better quality tool for $15 or $16 than continue to re, re, uh, rebuy that junk tool, which in turn, if you're an environmentalist, you're you know, you're, you're causing problems for them. You're driving to the store, getting a new tool. You're buying more product. You're throwing more product away if you really want to get into that kind of uh, – outset or outline of that so once we've got a good tool or tools 
and we know where we're going to plant. If we're planting in containers, not a big deal. We don't have to do this next step. But we want to call diggers hotlines for any other type of digging, even if we're doing raised beds, so you know what's under the ground. It's a free service. You do uh, you call 72 business hours prior to your uh, job open, you know, in the backyard, and they will mark the utilities underground and let you know what can and can't be dug or planted. And it's a, in those free, yeah. it's a free service. I don't know. Sorry if yeah. you said that. Yeah, it's a free service. And yeah, so that's one thing you want to do. And sometimes, you know, if this is your second year growing and you want to experiment with something, we've done that. We've grown um, chickpeas. Yakans, Akas. I totally forgot about the Akas, but yeah. we grew Akas. So yeah, it's something fun you can do as well. Maybe um, maybe you have a neighbor who is a newer grower like you, you, you and maybe you grow something different, and then you can exchange, whatever. So um, that's what it takes to start a garden. So it's a lot more than just uh, getting some uh, a shovel and digging in the ground. There's a lot of factors, just like anything in hobbies or careers. There's a lot of things that are under the umbrella that you, you know, you can't see the trees by the, the fork forest if, for from the trees. trees. Yeah, because there's so many things. Uh, and we're always here. Uh, that's what this program is for. And that's why we leave our communication lines open all the time is so you can reach out when you have questions. And there's no such thing as a dumb question, because if you've got a question you want you, you obviously want to be successful. We want to see you be successful. And there's no shame in asking a question that you may think is silly, but you don't know the answer. So you have every right to ask that question, no matter what level that you feel it's uh, silly or I should know this or common sense. Send it on over, Garden Talk Radio at gmail.com. And we can help you uh, either provide you a video or a resource of trusted means in order to get you the success in which we want you to see. Also, the success for uh, you know the gardeners, we like to grow vegetables, but also what about the meat? Well, uh, Walton's Incorporated has everything but the meat, and they have a bunch of great quality equipment. Right, so if you go to um, meatgistics.com, you can learn all about the hows and whys of meat processing, as well as they have over 15,000 users, which will help you with the meat processing technique issues, what have you. Whether you're making uh, jerky, whether you're making uh, little smokies, whether you make summer sausage or anything in between, they've got the seasoning, they've got the casings, they have the tools in order to do the job right the first time and to do it safely so it can be done properly in the way it should be done so you don't have to worry about uh, cutting corners. Right, and everything um, besides besides meatjustics.com, if you go to waltonsinc.com, they have different uh, seasoning, they have different products to help We've been working through their seasoning, yeah. and it's it's, it's phenomenal. phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely yeah. great. I mean, just even stuff to sprinkle on your potatoes or vegetables, whatever. Right. All sorts of great stuff. Waltonsinc.com is where your destination is there for everything but the meat. When we come back, it's going to be all about different types of gardening techniques. So you you may think you know a couple, and, and, and we all do, but there's many, many more. And we're going to go over the pros and cons of some of them, whether they may work for you or not, or for us as well. You're listening to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show, a program to help your garden grow better. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now, 1-800-927-SHOW. We here at the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show Gardens understand that healthy soil is the key to a successful garden. We know that chemical fertilizer burns carbon out of the soil and kills the microbes needed for a healthy soil ecosystem. No worries. Chicken Soup for the Soil by Dr. Jims will stimulate life into your soil, supplying all the nutrients most fertilizers neglect. Rather than force-feeding water-soluble chemical fertilizer, we suggest feeding the microbes a smorgasbord of 100% biodegradable nutrients that your plants can consume when they need them. The nutrients are readily available to maximize their genetic potential. Chicken soup for the soil will increase the quality of the fruit and vegetables you grow. Visit drjims.com. That's D-R-J-I-M-Z.com. 
Straw bale gardening is all the rage. Get your bale started easily with the Bell Buster Straw Bale Conditioning Formula. This is the only product that has been specifically formulated for use in straw bale gardening. Each unit contains 250 million colony forming units of trichoderma, fungi, and bacillus bacteria in addition to the fertilizer itself produces fantastic results with a bountiful production of vegetable crops start with the best to get the best traditional or organic formula take the guesswork out of conditioning your straw bale go to bellbuster.com to find out more you move your lawn sprinklers all over the yard but you always end up putting them in the same spots why not just bury them there out of sight always ready to use pre-adjusted to water the precise areas you want quick snap sprinklers makes it easy in-ground sprinklers without the hassle or expense of laying pipe put the sprinklers anywhere in your lawn or garden snap on a hose to supply the water water on it pops up water off it drops below ground you can mow right over it you can have a buried sprinkler system up and running in just minutes each quick snap saves thousands of dollars they install in minutes and operate for years visit quicksnapsprinkler.com if you could double the life of your raised bed boxes by sealing the wood with a clear non-toxic wood preservative would you well now you can with a clear penetrating product called internal wood stabilizer it's 100 non-toxic and easy to apply seal your untreated wood surfaces even chicken coops by spraying on internal wood stabilizer it's invisible seals the wood from the inside out and never wears off recommended by organic gardening experts internal wood stabilizer check it out at timberprocodingsusa.com Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit ivyorganics.com. We've been using a game-changing tool called SeedLinked to find and review our seeds this year. It makes finding the right seeds simple. It is driven by growers' data so you can really see what's best for your location. Check it out at SeedLinked.com or download the mobile app today. If you're sick of having a thin, poor colored lawn, despite all the fertilizing you do, you're not alone. The problem is the soil. It's compacted or clay-like, and basically there's not enough air in the root zone for healthy, vibrant growth. But this can be fixed a lot easier than you may think. Introducing Aerify Plus, liquid soil aerator. Aerify Plus from our friends at Nature's Lawn breaks up and revitalizes the soil, allowing life-giving air and nutrients to get to the roots of your lawn and your garden too. Garden Talk listeners, you can get 10% off Aerify Plus by going to natureslawn.com slash garden talk. That's natureslawn.com slash garden talk. The Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Simply Earth, Seed Savers Exchange, Quick Snap Sprinklers, Water Hoop, Timber Pro Coatings, Bloom and Easy Plants, Pomona Universal Pectin, Ivy Organics, Tiger Torch, Happy Leaf LED, Seed Link. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back Welcome back to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Happy to have you along. If you have plants, then you need to water them correctly. You probably are not watering them correctly, and tree diaper can be the answer to that problem. If your plants could talk to you, they would have a few complaints about not being properly watered, either too much or too little. How do you water properly? Take the guesswork out by using the tree diaper. Tree diaper is a revolutionary watering system that stabilizes soil moisture by taking up excess water and slowly releases it to plants when needed. The tree diaper is filled with water from rain or when you water and slowly releases water over three weeks. No pipes, hoses, or electricity needed. Whether you're a first-time gardener or advanced, tree diaper will improve the way you water your plants. Made in the USA, check out all the sizes they have available. Tree diaper will keep your plants happy. That's treediaper.com. That's treediaper.com. Tree diaper will keep your ha- plants happy. Keep them happy, keep them watered so they keep producing and just are healthier. So there's many different types of gardening methods. And we're familiar with, you know, if he said, name me off a couple of very familiar, familiar garden meth- uh, pl- uh, gardening methods, you would say? 
I would say raised beds in the ground container. Top three, right top there. Three, yeah. Okay. So, but there's many, many others, and some other. You know, I'm sure there's people that's yelling at the uh, radio right now, going, "Those weren't the three I guessed," and that's fine. <laughs> Uh, you can call us and tell us. Yeah, call us and let us know. 1-800-927-SHOW. And uh, we're going to go over several of them here, some that we've used and use, and others that we have not used uh, but feel that would be really neat and, and beneficial if we had the means and capabilities of doing such. So Straw Bell Garden. Uh, you heard the Bell Buster ad uh, there in that break. To condition the bale, you have to condition the bale in order to get the internal portions to break down into that humus in order for the plants to feed off of that. We've done this with one bale. We've done this with nine bales. It works no matter as long as you follow the recipe that Joe Karsten, the author of the Straw Bale Garden book, uh, describes and, and instructs you in. Yeah, it, does, it, it works great. That's the key is you'll find a bunch of, I don't know, clickbait yeah. Haters who are like this didn't work, but they didn't do anything. They just put their plants in a bale. And, and you clicked to... on the ma- uh, clicked on the site, and they get an, uh, they ten get cents their... for every click yeah. they get from you know whomever and probably, however they work. Probably yeah. not ten cents, but whatever. Yeah. So no, you need to do your your uh, conditioning, and it works beautifully. Yeah. Uh, vertical gardening. Now, this is a means that many urban gardeners that you uh, utilize, you people that live out in the country that have acreages of garden, this is, you know, let them sprawl out the pumpkins, the eggplant, or the, the cucumbers, the uh, all that stuff. We city people, I grew up on a farm, so the only thing we ever trellised is peas. Uh, we have to utilize the space, and by going vertical, we can do that with cucumbers and some melons, uh, uh, pole beans, all, a gamut peas, of uh, peas. Yeah. yeah, everything. Even your tomatoes, um, it's not necessarily vertical gardening, but those vine tomatoes, they benefit greatly from being um, put up. Right, and you know, many of us have that problem with the cages falling over, and EasyStepProducts.com has the, uh, the answer on that one, uh, a sturdy tomato cage for you another one is hydroponics now this can be done primarily indoors i mean i'm sure there's some applications during the summer months that are exercised outdoors but hydroponics is the process of using water uh putting nutrients in the water and passing that through the root system whether that being clay pellets or clay balls uh or other means uh, pvc pipe and then the plants grow in that means. Also, there is the aquaponics. Well, there's we'll get oh. to that, but the cracking method, the passive hydroponics, where you don't have any water. It's uh, no pa- no moving water. It's stagnant water with nutrients in it in order for your plants to grow. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we do practice the hydroponic system in a. Um, I don't want to. I don't know what you want to call it. It's a square bucket with that. It's a Dutch. I think it's a Dutch Dutch bucket system. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we do. Uh, practice that method so it, and it works really well we put it by a window we grow lettuce in it we grow some herbs in it doesn't uh it, you can do it year round right. uh, so then we have the back to eden method which is the wood chips and people are like don't wood chips suck nitrogen out of your soil but this is the the wood chips break down and it kind of amends the soil over time and then it is a nutrient rich yeah you know, it's one of these things where you let it set for a number of years before you try to utilize that area in a growing condition. <clears throat> so, well, you know, that it pros and cons on that. It works great if you give the time allowed for it to do its thing. Uh, another one is what you brought up earlier was aquaponics, which is the practice of the same as hydroponics, but instead of adding nutrients, and you might add some nutrients, but very minimal. We've never practiced this uh, particular method of growing, but you have a fish reservoir. Uh, tank where the fish live and that water and their waste product gets pumped through the root system of the plants in which you're growing and that's how they uh, live and you got to make sure the pH levels are right for the fish and then for the plants and it's a, it's a kind of a, a sciencey thing but it's very beneficial and some people uh, you know you get two bangs for the buck there you get the plants in which you're growing and then some people will eat the fish after they get to a certain size too so you can utilize uh, a, lot of, a lot of people do that if they can. Right. Yeah. So another one is uh, square foot gardening. Now, Holly, can you explain what that particular method is and why many new gardeners, uh, we would recommend utilizing this type of system? Sure. So square foot gardening is where you're growing a crop 
per square foot essentially you don't have to grow just one crop, crop per square foot you can grow like three square feet of crops but it's it grids out your garden for you and this works really well um it it yields more per square foot than planting in rows so you get more bang for your buck basically um so something like an example of planting in a square foot one square foot would be one tomato one square foot would be nine beets one square foot is 16 radishes and you can kind of plot your garden out that way the other good thing is is that something like radishes that grow quite rapidly in the spring you can then replace with a tomato once they're growing so you can easily swap out a square foot for one thing and it works really well and and the other thing is let's say you put nine bean plants in that one square foot if you have a crop failure you've just lost one square foot and you may if you you know if you have a uh, 16 square foot four by four area you could do you know beans on the corner and radish you know that you could grid it out different ways so you can have uh, two different squares with the same thing or secession plants so you have a crop that's ready now and then a crop that's ready in a week and a half and so on and so forth based on the time of year uh, on your cool weather or warm weather crops so works very well there's many different charts online um, obviously if you have four tomato plants in four square feet things are going to get very tight there but it, it, it does work it does work very well it's it's definitely very doable it's just something to keep in mind that and you can also if you don't do containers you can or if you don't do raised beds or in the ground you can kind of put this into a container garden if you use like something that's the size of a five gallon bucket that's about one right square foot of surface so you can transfer that thought pattern to that now the other and then the next one on the list is an underground greenhouse. Now, it's not necessarily underground. The ma the majority of it's underground, but it has a roof on top of it, and that is called a wallapini. This is a really cool method that I think you know you could basically grow year round because if you're in a basement, it stays a certain temperature year round. You know, very very close to the same temperature. So what this practice is, you dig a hole, a square, and you know you go. A certain uh, footage deep and like eight or ten feet deep you say the top soil that you dug off and you bring that back down to the base of it once you've got your the bottom created ten feet deep and then you grow in that uh, this is uh, used in many parts of the world as a everyday growing technique and it's you know it it would serve probably beneficial purposes in the northern portions of the United States where a couple of weeks ago, many of us were at sub-zero ambient temperature. And uh, when if you're 10 feet down and you're trying to grow your cool weather crops, I think it would work very, very well. Right. And if you cover that with um, whatever, a tunnel type thing. Or even or, just like a framework. Or a framework. Yeah. Or what have you. And then on those colder days, you could add another layer of plastic mm -hmm. That's going to give you more heat. So that's a pretty, pretty neat thing. And, and finally, you got the greenhouse. Some people grow only in greenhouses or in high tunnels or cold frames, that type of thing. Uh, I know it's pretty popular in the UK and the allotments. A lot of them will grow year-round in those tunnels or high tunnels, um, and it works very, very well for them. And you got a little more control because you don't have to worry about, one, animals, uh, the deers, the, the raccoons, whatever, coming in and, and taking out the stuff. But two, you can kind of control uh, bad insects. The only problem with that is if you've got 27 tomatoes in your high tunnel and you have a infestation of something, it's going to take over very, very rapidly. Uh, and uh, unless you're on top of it, you're not going to uh, be able to control it very easily. Right. Um, I just want to talk about real quickly that these are some alternative methods. Okay. Uh -huh. There's nothing wrong with growing in the ground, raised bed, containers, what have you. And then also, you don't have to just use one method. No. You can make you can do all of these if you wanted to, realistically. I mean, if you rent an apartment, your landlord might not appreciate you digging uh, down an underground uh, uh, wallapini. Yeah, but I, mean, I would, I would, I would do it and then ask for permission, right, uh, ask right. for forgiveness well, later. Yeah. Well, I guess since you went through all that work, um, <laughs> check your lease. Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, 
But yeah, you can definitely interchange these and think about what works for you. Right. And, and you can also try something um, or maybe perhaps go online if you're thinking about investing in a greenhouse or building a greenhouse. And definitely if you are going to do something like a greenhouse that might become an almost permanent structure, make sure that's something you can do in your city or municipality. Right. I mean, we do raised beds. We do ground. We do uh, containers. We do straw bales. We do aqua uh, hydroponics. Um, you know, and we do square foot gardening. We do a we little do like window, w- window, window garden. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's, it's just like anything else. Why do you grow six or seven or eight or dozens of different varieties of tomatoes? One for the, the variety and the, the versatility, but also the secondly. So if you do have a crop failure on one sp- specific variety or type, it doesn't wipe out everything. You have backups to that. And that's why, uh, you know, on the farm growing up, we would always get six or se- uh, five or six different types of seed corn and soybeans. So if one had a crop failure or didn't yield as good as the other ones, it wasn't a doomsday. We had backup to back. If we had corn, we had soybeans, we had wheat, we had hogs, we had cattle. So if something failed and, or two things failed, we still was able to manage and survive. Well, Holly, some uh, temperatures are warming up and soon it will be summer. That's right. And you do not want to share your your yard with beetles and grubs. I don't. Right. So it's, it's time to start thinking about that. You know, there's all sorts of Japanese beetles articles. Grubs are gross little bugs anyway. Um, and there's lots of different information. So grub gone can be applied to the turf or garden around ornamentals to control grubs and lessen the impact that beetles have on your yard this summer. Easy to use, you apply with a commercial spreader and irrigate it into the soil. Biologically, it specifically targets grub and beetle invaders without harming beneficial bugs like bees, ladybugs, and butterflies. And it's the only non-chemical that works. You can find out more at phylumbioproducts.com. That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M bioproducts.com. Phylum bioproducts. When we come back, Bruce, uh, Dylan Bruce will be with us. He is the founder of an app that we can all benefit from called Seedlink. You're listening to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed-starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants to multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Use coupon code RADIO21 and get 15% off your entire order. Rinse Kit. Pressurized water on the go. No pumping, no battery. Simply fill from your spigot or sink on the way out for up to five minutes of spray time. Anywhere. Live dirty. Rinse clean with Rinse Kit. Seed Savers Exchange has been saving, preserving, and sharing heirloom seeds since 1975. And today continues to provide those seeds for gardeners just like you. They have over 600 varieties. Visit SeedSavers.org to request a free catalog or to purchase seeds online for this year's growing season. That's SeedSavers.org. Dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position. Step, twist, pull, and plant. Visit ProPlugger.com. Did you know that all flour is not created equal? Janie's Mill carefully stone grinds all their certified organic, wheat, rye, corn, buckwheat, and heirloom, and ancient grains so that you get every bit of taste and nutrition nature intended. Some flowers really are better than others, and you deserve the best. Get it at janiesmill.com. Do you know there's a real Tiger Torch? Visit tigertorchltd.com for more information. Joey here of the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. And like you, we've struggled to find a good plant support system that can last for more than one season or two and be easily stored. But now there is. Easy Step Products manufactures a unique multifunction and multi-purpose plant support system. It's designed for tomato plants, but is useful for any vegetable and flower plants you're growing. This is like having a 24-7 bodyguard for your plants. The 60-inch heavy-duty Easy Step end post and easy rings are overbuilt by design so that when you combine the two together, they make the perfect plant support system on the market. I love that you can add the rings during the growth cycle without 
damaging the plant. It's easy to adjust them up and down, and they store so easily. They even have a no-hassle 10-year warranty, and they're made in America. Order now and receive a third plant support absolutely free with purchase of any kit and use promo code JOEY123. Buy yours today at EasyStepProducts.com or visit the dealer locator for closest retailer near you or purchase at Mother Earth News General Store. EasyStepProducts.com The Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Blue Ribbon Organics Naturally Green Products Ironwood Tool Company Easy Step Products Rinse Kit Soul Brew Kabucha Wild Delight Rikon Vitova Chip Drop Bailbuster.com Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Happy you've hung around for our guest uh, just moments away. First of all, spiders are our friends in the garden, but no one wants spiders in their homes, and Rescue has the product in which can eliminate them uh, from your house. That's right, and they become more active as spring arrives. Um, they resume mating, and last year spiders' eggs will hatch as they they thaw out or find new homes. Um, you can use Rescue spider traps to keep them at bay in your house or garage and sheds. Rescue spider traps can pre-assemble in a hard plastic shell. A much thinner and sleeker design can be tucked under furniture or in other tight spaces. They're also more discreet than other spider traps. The trap is dark in color, so trap spiders are not easily seen. Um, scientists discovered dots of glue are better for trapping spiders. The other sheets of glue out there trap spiders along just the edges, um, and they have to be thrown out sooner. So the dots of, the dots of glue help the spiders stick better. Um, they have a, the glue dot technology. So just like the other rescue spider products, their spider traps are made in the USA. Yay. You're going to go to rescue.com to find out more information and where to buy. Control the spiders in your house, but let them be in the garden. Let's go to the hotline, Holly, and bring in our guest for this week. Dylan Bruce is the head of the breeding network of Seedlinked and the seed partner business development lead. He grew up on a CSA farm in southwest Wisconsin and has worked within the food system since. You can find out more at seedlinked.com. Welcome to the program, Dylan. Thank you. It's great to be with you today. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, you're very welcome. Now, total disclaimer, Seedlinked is a sponsor of the program, so I want to be get that transparency out. But <clears throat> for people who are not familiar with this, uh, what is Seed Linked? Uh, and, and to start out with, it's an app for your mobile device, and, and I'll let you take it from there. That's right. Yeah, Seed Linked is actually a web and mobile app uh, for gardeners and farmers to find seed, track, and review their plantings, and participate in citizen science programs for breeding and trialing vegetables, uh, and also to communicate with other growers. So Seed Link connects people sort of throughout the seed supply chain from plant breeders, to seed companies, to growers, to chefs, and other eaters. And when everyone contributes their data and feedback on a common platform from how well a variety resists to disease, to how it yields, how good it tastes, um, everyone can really make better decisions. So what's unique about SeedLink, I think, is that our seed search engine is backed by data from other growers so that people can really reliably choose the varieties that are best for their context. Um, it's also a super easy uh, app to track and review your plantings to share with other growers. So sort of like Kayak guides travelers to their right flights for their needs, uh, Seedlink can help growers find the right variety for them and help them track and compare over time. So, so essentially, if Holly and I are growing a variety of leaf lettuce that we think is really good and we find and we grow it and it's miserable and it's no good, we can rate that on your app. And if other growers around us rate that as a negative or bad type of plant, then somebody in Nebraska can look at it and go, they're kind of in the same region. Maybe I don't want to grow this. Is, is that how this can in a worry? Yeah, that's, that's really exactly right. But, you know, it may be that that same variety of lettuce that doesn't do well for us here in Wisconsin does great out in California or in the southeast, say. So it really helps identify those sort of pockets of regional adaptation for varieties to really, um, it's truly a recommendation engine where, you know, it's really fitting something to your context. And that's 
that's really based on a crowdsourcing principle where really it's it's the growers coming together to build this communal knowledge and this sort of collective intelligence to, to be able to make better decisions. And from what uh, I understand of the app, this is not this is completely independent because as you know, and, and Holly and I know, if you are a seed company, you're going to try to make your seeds look better than other people and kind of shy and push away and maybe uh, not make the negative ratings so visible uh, in a dirty way. But with you, with the seed linked app, it what it is is what it is. There's no hiding of anything. It's true fact. That's right. So, so the growers own their own data on seed link. You know, it's not like some other things where you're you know, giving the data away. So it truly is the grower's reviews and perspective that shine through. Uh, and, and, and so ab- absolutely, it's, if something doesn't do well, that's going to show up there. You know, you can, you can see those one-star reviews, but when you're a grower, that's just as important to know. And it doesn't mean that that seed company's variety isn't a good fit um, somewhere in the country, but it just m- might not be right for you. And so actually growers, when they're looking for new varieties, they can uh, filter by, you know, say your USDA hardiness zone to see reviews that are from a similar context. Um, and really, it's dedicated to bringing sort of transparency and efficiency to the seed purchase process because, um, and, and we have over uh, nearly 20 seed companies participating now. So um, almost all of those are listing their catalog on the seed search engine that growers can really be searching across multiple companies on one platform. So I think it might surprise some listeners to realize that really vegetable seed is sold under the same model as it was in the 1800s, which is a a seed company catalog model. And even though we have online sales now, when you go to look for the right seed for you, you're looking at individual companies' offerings. And, And, you know, you have to, whether it's dog earing the corner of a seed catalog or flipping between between websites, you do have to flip back and forth between the companies, and it makes it difficult to compare the traits that they say their varieties have, the see what's in stock where, and, and compare prices if you need to. Um, and so our platform brings all the companies together on one site so that you can easily search and look at those actual grower reviews that back up the data. So I like to contrast it to really any other consumer good. If you think about it, where let's say a a listener wants to buy a new backpack, they can go on any number of websites, search across hundreds of companies in one place, look at the features, uh, see how things are backed up by the reviews, um, and seamlessly buy from multiple companies in one place. And that's sort of the new norm in our world. So why not proceed? Because the thing is, the stakes are even higher with seed because if you choose the wrong backpack you know you can go return it get a new one try again but if you choose the wrong variety of seed to grow in your garden you might not have another chance until next season so really the stakes are a lot higher yeah you can't uh dig up that lettuce and send it back to the uh, seed company and go hey can i get a refund on this (laughs) this doesn't work so well that's right if only yeah so you are definitely very passionate about people having access to Um, a variety of seed choices why is that important i mean aside from what you just mentioned about you know buying the backpack returning the backpack you can't really return the seeds but why is it important that we we have access to the variety of different seeds just in general yeah absolutely it's it's a really important issue it's important that growers have access to quality seed and the information about those choices that go with the seed for many issues so You know, think about perhaps a good example of the utility of Seedlink here is when basil downy mildew showed up, right? So, you know, none of the varieties that we could grow are resistant to it. I mean, I could barely get a harvest of basil at the same time as a tomato. And that's sort of a medium urgency case, but not as bad as, you know, the year that maybe a Nelson carrot was dropped and I was left there like, shoot, that was our best carrot that we grew. Now, now what do I grow? So, whatever the cause, if it's purely for fun and exploration, sometimes we all got to grow something new in the garden, right? And so you need options out there and you need information that goes with it to help guide a decision and and make an informed decision. It's equally important for the seed companies to get that feedback and know how their products are performing. 
So we're all kind of familiar, you know, with the, with the story of consolidation in the seed industry, the really big mega corporations that people like to point their fingers at, you know, and th- those companies absolutely have a place for breeding the production varieties that they do, but there's actually sort of a U-shaped trend. So it's not just consolidation and big players. There's actu- actually increasing numbers of small regionally focused air, uh, seed companies that, you know, focus on the story of the heirlooms that they carry, or maybe a, a particular region. Maybe they really focus on things that do well in the Great Lakes region. So these seed companies maybe don't have as much visibility as they deserve yet. And they're out there increasingly uh, popping up these smaller companies because there is a demand for this regionally adapted seed. So by supporting these, uh, you know, varieties and seed companies that are may- maybe a little smaller, maybe a little less known or unique, we're preserving that diversity of seeds available for future generations, and we're putting that money back into our, in our into our region, or, or um, you know, rather than a, a big corporation. And that really is part of the sense of community on seed length of really. Um, having the story of the seeds live on, even to the extent of every review that is submitted about a variety is really part of that living, evolving seed story. So it doesn't just stop at the catalog description. Um, it, it, it goes beyond that to let's see what you know people in, in our neighborhood have said about it. Because, of course, if, if we know how their experience was with a variety, it's really going to help us decide whether or not to grow it. Um, yes. So, so, so that's one of the things. And as, as you know, climate change or new pests and diseases, or even changing preferences, like, you know, a different flavor profile that's preferred by people, it it helps to have those options out there. Um, and then it also helps to catalog them efficiently in one place and be able to really search across the options. I mean, for goodness sake, there's over 5,000 varieties of tomato available online today. So how do you even begin to sort through those and really and really see? No individual person, you know, it would take a lifetime of trialing. No individual person can do that. But together, we can come together, build a healthier food system that really starts with the seed um, by, with this shared and connected data. Yeah, definitely. So we're talking with Dylan Bruce, the head of the breeding network of Seedlinked. And just as you were talking about, you know, having the variety, um, I don't know if you want to touch quickly on the importance of seed biodiversity and why we want to keep that biodiversity as opposed to over time eliminating it down and why we want we want to have that variety versus, you know, growing or I'm saying like growing what maybe our grandparents grew and maybe we don't grow what our grandparents grew. What is the importance of that biodiversity and why do we want to continue that tradition? Yeah, absolutely. I can take a stab at that. You know, it's it's funny that you mentioned what our grandparents grew because actually in a sense, that's one of the things that we're really trying to preserve is those historical food ways and maybe the older varieties. So you know, if we if we hearken back to times past, there were many independent, you know, regional, even, uh, you know, state level and, and many seed companies in each state really serving the particular needs of those growers. Because, for instance, our needs here in the Midwest are very different than the needs of growers out in the Central Valley of California. And yet, because that's the largest seed market, because so many vegetables are grown out there, they have an outsized influence on what is offered through seed catalogs. And that means that over time, as there's been consolidation um, and and really, you know, we've moved towards this very much economy of scale in in agriculture and even in gardening, um, you know, what that means is that uh, some of those varieties that did so well here in the Midwest uh, aren't carried aren't carried anymore just because they don't do well in the Central Valley, but really that's a problem of of data in a sense because it's not that there's no market for that variety. It's not that nobody wants it. It's that the market isn't big enough for that really big company to service. But if we can enable sort of the framework for these smaller independent seed companies to truly cater to the the regional and and niche needs, so 
you know, environmental niche or, or a market niche of, of growers that, that they can be very closely in touch with, um, then we can preserve some of those varieties. And as we also evolve, you, you know, and move forward to face new stresses in, in our gardens, perhaps because of climate change or whatever it might be, whether it's a new pest or disease or, you know, maybe that tomato just isn't tasting as good as it used to with all the rain that we've been getting that's when we start to look for new varieties. And if we don't preserve that diversity, it won't be out there when we need it. And when the seed companies are developing new varieties, you know, those don't come out of thin air, right? They have to start somewhere. And they start with these old varieties that have some of the traits that, that they might want. Absolutely. Well, Dylan, we greatly appreciate the time you've given us. Uh, once again, will you tell our listeners uh, how to get a hold of the Seed Linked app and uh, desktop and the computer, how they can find all of that and where it's available at online? Absolutely. So folks can download the Seed Linked app on Google Play or the Apple uh, App Store and check it out that way. It's also online at seedlinked.com. And one thing I'd love to plug before we jump off here is our, our seed collection experiences, which are closing soon. And these are curated sets of varieties for a given crop, curated by an expert, whether it's um, Craig LaHoulier in, in North Carolina, who's a great tomato grower curating tomato collections, or Organic Seed Alliance doing some beginning seed saver collections. Folks can, can get these collections, you get the seeds, and then you also get to grow along with these curators. So it's a really great introduction to the seed link, really learning how to use that critical eye to rate things in your garden. But we'd welcome anyone to, to jump in and use the seed search or just rate the plantings that they have anyways. Well, Dylan, we greatly appreciate you taking time. We thank you so much. And again, seed linked on your mobile uh, app store and online. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much, and I hope everyone has a great planting season. Absolutely. And when we come back, it's going to be your garden questions, our garden answers. You're listening to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. We're going to help your garden grow better. Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now 1-800-927-SHOW. We know that you appreciate the value of a beautifully landscaped yard, but tackling such a project yourself can seem way too complicated, right? Bloomin' Easy plants are the answer. Their plants are low maintenance and offer exceptional beauty and color for your yard. Plus, they offer free seasonal care reminders with simple how-to videos tailored to the plants that you choose. With Bloomin' Easy on your side, creating the yard that you've always wanted becomes as easy as plant, water, and relax. Check them out at your local garden center or by visiting bloominseasyplants.com. Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit blueribbonorganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. Wild Delight has a complete line of premium feed for wild birds and other wildlife. It contains the finest ingredients for your outdoor birds. Fill your bird feeders with a selection of Wild Delight's premium quality mixes to have a yard full of colorful birds. Wild Delight's premium mixes are made with tasty nuts and berries and not just filler food like milo and cracked corn. Feed the birds the nutrition they need. This keeps your feathered friends coming back year after year. Find out more at wilddelight.com. Make watering easy. DripWorks provides quality drip irrigation supplies and equipment to gardeners just like you for all your growing needs across the U.S. and Canada. Purchase online at dripworks.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. The Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Pro Plugger, Dripworks, Waltons Incorporated, Tree Diaper, 
Janie's Mill, Phylum Bioproducts, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Nature's Lawn and Garden Incorporated, Deer Defeat, Dr. Jim's, Root Maker. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Thank you for being part of the program today. You can get a hold of us if you've got a question at 1-800-927-SHOW, coast to coast, toll free, 1-800-927-SHOW. You can also send us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com, and we'll help you out with what you have an issue with. Got several questions that came in this week. We'll see how many we can get through to the top of the hour. If I grow shorty onions in the north, will they even grow at all? Well, as we talked about early on in the, in the show, onions fall into three different categories. Short day, long day, and neutral or midday. And these are based on the l- number of hours of sunlight that is they are per, per, they are receiving during the summer months in the northern portions of the United States. We get about 14 hours to 15 hours of sunlight during the afternoons, and that's a long day onion. In the south, they get fewer hours, and that's a short day onion. And um, different times in which the onions are growing in the United States. So uh, basically, here's the here's the after I've explained that, if you grow a short day onion in the north, you're going to get green tops. You're not going to get almost no bulb development. Same occurs if you try to grow a long day in the south. You're going to get a lot of green growth, almost no bulb development. So if you're growing for just greens, yeah, it works fine. If you're actually growing for bulb development, not so much. Uh, John writes in, I am located outside of the Boston, Massachusetts area, and I have a very small vegetable garden, about 10 foot by 20 foot. I put in four inches or so of compost cow manure every fall. My question is regarding wood ash. I normally generate about two to five gallon buckets of the uh, two to three five gallon buckets of the wood ash over the winter i dumped this in the garden and it really has seemed to suppress the plant supercharge supercharge my apologies uh, there john supercharge the uh, plant growth i usually put it on the in the spring just before the rainstorm occurs so if it gets washed in so it gets washed in the soil but i have also read that i need to be careful and not use too much so my question is how much is too much or how much should i use i also have a border garden with irises and various herbs and spices can i put the wood ash there how about the lawn too thanks for the help that you can provide yeah so you can you want to the method or amount whatever is three pounds per 1,000 square feet every four weeks you don't have to do it every four weeks but if you have enough to do it every four weeks and you can do it every four weeks it's water soluble so if you feel like you've added too much um, continuous watering can help rinse it through and then you that, can... that, that's one of the easy things you <laughs> added too much just water it, it'll it'll dissipate some of these things like chemicals it's years before it remitigate you can remitigate right. the soil yeah so I mean and for what somebody collects in there you know, from their wood, wood stove or as whatever. As long as it's natural wood. It's not pressure treated or... Right, but yeah. you're probably not going to make enough to mess up your no. soil to dump it on there. But you can also add it to your iris and herbs, your beds, and then you can certainly sprinkle it on, sprinkle it on your lawn as well. All right. I uh, hope that helps you, John. Uh, also, uh, next question here. Uh, I've noticed that you have spoke about and seen videos of you applying shredded paper as mulch in your garden. Does the wind blow the shredded paper away? Well, it really doesn't. It actually, if you you can water over it, and then once you water over it, it seems to make this like um, I don't know crust, paste? crust almost, yeah. but not cru- not enough crust where it's not going to let In, you know preventing the water, water from yeah. yeah. But it does create kind of a crust, and no, not much blows around. It seems to kind of just stay there. All right, next question here. Uh, how would you keep indoor containers warm? Would the best method be to lay a mulch around the top of the plants on the soil, or what would you suggest? Thank you. So one thing you can do is you can certainly um, take. I'm, I'm a, assuming this is like a non unclimatized basement or garage or or potential you know greenhouse of some sort. If you're in your home, you wouldn't need to uh, 
do any additional items any additional methods to keep that them plants warm right uh, yeah probably like a garage or a right. shed or something um so you can buy heating mats for your plants you can buy a space heater but that might be costly for you you can wrap blankets around the base of your plants you can wrap bubble wrap around the base of your like around the the bottom of the container what have you you can certainly take uh, newspaper or brown paper bags and use it as mulch um, to give it a little bit more heat but just whatever you can do to kind of wrap around those pots or mm -hmm. those containers is going to help keep that warmth in you could even even use like bubble wrap yeah uh, that would work as well so yeah. just a unique uh, situation and hope that that answer uh, gives the information that you need well with that being said we are out of time and we appreciate yours miss any portion of this program or want to revisit it in its entirety you can do that by going to our parent website the wisconsin vegetable gardener.com and clicking on the season five tab at the top of the page you can also revisit past shows and past seasons on that upper tab there uh, or you can uh, go to your favorite podcast plas platform platform and search the gardening with joey and holly radio show wisconsin vegetable gardening all of those names will give you the show and you can just send us an email at garden talk radio at gmail.com and we will send you the link to this show uh and uh Get it easily that way. Tune in next week. Do not miss the program. We'll be covering seven spring and summer flowers that you can plant right now for that beauty in the er, beauty of this summer. You don't have to worry about planting them last fall to get them to come up. As well as going over families of squash and some challenges you may face when growing them. Our guest will be a uh, longtime show friend and author Jessica Walliser out of the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area will be with us and we'll be answering your garden questions. So until next week for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden.